watching AYV Television. Hello and welcome to the interview. Um, unfortunately, today, no handshaking due to the current state of um, the globe. And Sierra Leone not being left out, we continue to suffer from the um, corona pandemic. However, the show goes on. And uh, today, we're speaking to the country's um, anti-corruption commissioner, Francis Ben Kaifala. He has spent two years in office. So he's here to share his experiences with us since he took over and how he is faring on in that particular commission that has um, been in the spotlight for um, its um, successes in the last um, 24 months. And uh, good afternoon and welcome to A very the show. good afternoon to you, Samuel. Always mm -hmm. a pleasure to sit with you and discuss issues. L l let me start off. I I how are you faring on amidst um, the new normal COVID-19? Well, we, we have readjust, uh, readjusted lifestyles, um, mm -hmm. personally and, of course, at the institution. Um, reduced the workforce by half, provided mm -hmm. alternative um, office hours, but generally try to observe the various restrictions and the recommendations given by WHO and the government. Wash your hands, mask up, uh, avoid social contacts, and uh, ensure that you take necessary precautions to not transfer the sick or contract it. So that is, that is what we are working on. Right, that's the new normal. Now let, let's go to, to you. Um, so you serving as the commissioner for the country's anti-graft body. Now take us through the first thing. Uh, what was the state of inheritance, the commission, when you took over? What was it like? Well, as you know, uh, the Anti-Corruption Commission had been in existence since uh, 2001. After the 2008, 2000, the law was passed in the year 2000. The institution was established in 2001. And various commissioners had come and gone. Strategies differ with commission, uh, with commissioners. And uh, of course, I came in at a time when we had had uh, about uh, six commissioners before my coming in. And uh, I, I picked up from where they stopped. They had done a lot. They did what they could in their own way to tackle and fight corruption. However, at the time I came in, the indexes were not reacting very well to what they were doing. Uh, we were lying very badly in most global indexes. Um, also, institutionally, there were various problems within uh, staff welfare issues, um, relationship between the institution and the uh, various institutions in the country. Those were all issues that were there. And uh, overall, it made the fight against corruption not to be where we would want it to be. And I came from the backdrop of that. Um, with those um, things you've highlighted, and um, so to speak, uh, many would say you came in controversially because your predecessor, um, there was this controversy of his tenure of office and you came in at that period. Yes. So how was your takeoff amidst those controversies? Well, I, 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 I went on with the mindset to get on with the job. Um, I went on believing that uh, whatsoever the issues are, I am here now. And uh, my responsibility is to take on the job and move it forward. And I basically hit the ground running. Firstly, try to rally the staff around me, uh, make them understand the vision, uh, empathize with them, their issues and problems, try to solve them as we go along. So you don't focus too much on the external and you forget the internal. Try to, to align the internal, the internal first, and that we did very well. Mm. And once the staff understood what this was about, I was able to command their confidence and they stood behind me. And standing with me, we now moved the work of the commission forward within the shortest possible time. And it wasn't long before results started coming in. And uh, basically that is how it happened. I came in, hit the ground running, Forget about what is out there. Just move on with the work. Um, you, 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 you are the seventh commissioner in, in, in that commission. So, now, when you were um, just a lawyer outside of the commission, what vision um, did you have about the Anti-Corruption Commission in terms of their strategies and how the fight was going on? Well, I, uh, generally, I, I, over the years, I, 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 I viewed what was happening at the commission I believe that there were a lot of things that could have been done differently. I believe as a country we could have taken the fight against corruption more seriously earlier on. 
And I believe that commissioners could have rallied a lot more support behind them to lead the fight against corruption. I also believe that uh, we needed to really uh, stop babying corruption. We, we needed to tackle it head on with strategies that were to show that this is a human catastrophe. And when you are, uh, as they say, um, drastic situations require drastic measures. So basically, I thought that um, over the years we have been babying corruption and we needed to deviate from that if we are to set this path on the foundations of social revolution that would be beneficial for the children of Sierra Leone, those today and those to come. So, so when you took over, having um, realized that um, these are the things that we needed earlier in fighting corruption, when you, when you took over, did that vision change or is it the same vision you're going with? No, well, I was first of all hopeful that the, the vision that I have has to align with the vision of the president of Sierra Leone. And I was lucky to have a president who I believe clearly had that vision by his promises in the manifesto. And I was also lucky that uh, the lot fell on him to lead the fight against corruption as he would want it fought, uh, as he had declared. And uh, he proceeded to appoint me. So, and uh, we had preliminary conversations with him as to how we we're going to tackle this on. And it was very clear that our visions clearly aligned for country. And that came in. Uh, with what was there. So when I went in, it was just to move on with it. it. It was not a question of trying to wait, trying to convince anybody, trying, no, no, no. It was to say this is the path. Even the staff, when I met with them, the first day I went to the commission, we had a meeting, I clearly told them what I had come to do, working with them, and that is what we are going to achieve, and that is what we are going to pursue. And we set in motion quickly what we wanted to do, and before you could realize it, the effect was already taking root in the country. And that takes me to what um, critics have been saying, that uh, they've been attributing your successes in the commission largely to um, what they've described as um, you were appointed to deliver the victor's justice. And uh, you, ju you just mentioned that um, your vision and the vision of the president aligned, whether it's um, to fight corruption or it's to go with the victor's justice, as your critics are saying, where do you stand? And that is the, that, that anybody who thinks that, first of all, is not informed as to what is happening in the, cons in the, in the commission, or maybe it's just the product of their own cynicism, because the evidence abounds that what we are doing in the commission goes beyond any victor's justice. Yes, people in the previous government, many of them were very corrupt. Yes, we did go after them. We pursued them. We arrested some. We detained some. We prosecuted some. Some are still standing trial, some have been convicted, and some are still under investigation. I will continue to investigate them. As long as we treat them fairly, as long as what we do is evidence-based, I don't have any issue with it. I believe that public servants have to be accountable. It does not matter whether you are in the past or current government. If the evidence is against you that you are corrupt, I will work with my team to make sure that we investigate you. So. We, we did that, the convictions are there, the records are there, the recoveries we made from some of them are there, the admissions that they made that they were corrupt themselves are there. So um, it was not about a victor's justice. But going beyond that, you can see that clearly at the time I came in, I mean, these other people had just come in. They had not even spent a year in office. You were not going to know what is happening. You would not see the audit trails. You would not be able to do, but now all this is there and things are happening. Evidence has been coming in. So you can see that we have focused on the past, moved along with it. We intersected with the present very well. There are many cases which happened in the current regime which we went in and dealt with very robustly. For example, when the Commission of Inquiry money was taken, by the director at the Ministry of Information. The moment it came to my attention, we went in, investigated swiftly. Within two weeks, we prosecuted. There was a sentence, OK? And that sentence is being served. Moving beyond that, uh, maritime administration, the head, there were allegations against her. We went in. We did not say because it's the current government we should not do anything. We went in swiftly, did what we had to do. And we, we are recovering from, from the head, and many other staffs who were working there, the auditor, the, the finance director, and all those people. Apart from that, there was the state chief of protocol in as high as the office of the president. 
when the video came out and there was public concerns around it about her wealth and all those things, we went in and investigated. It does not matter that we found out that she was not culpable, but at least we did investigate as high as the office of the president. That is unprecedented in this country. We talk about the Rice investigation, which involved the sitting minister of labor and the deputy minister of education and the permanent minister Mini, the permanent secretary in the Ministry of Education and the nutritionist in the Ministry of Education, amongst many others. We investigated. As I speak with you, we are investigating the current parliament. Issues involving. We are investigating the current par parliament robustly. We have investigated councils in the current system. We have investigated many more areas touching. You know the stink operations we have been operating. We have tried and convicted military officers. We have investigated the police in the current government. We have investigated healthcare officers. We have many cases in court involving the Ministry of Health officers, doctors, and those other people. The ambit of our operations does not know boundaries as long as it is within the public interest and for public service. So the statistics that we have of our investigations and what we are doing at the commission it is simply disingenuous for anybody to say that what we are doing in the commission is focused on the past. Because the evidence abounds that we are in fact now dealing with the present, that we are dealing with the past. Although we are waiting for the commission of inquiry recommendations to come out and we may have to do more, a lot more in, uh, interactions with the past as well. But to say that we are dealing with the past alone is not true. And if we are dealing with the past, our credentials will not have been as stellar as we have it now who will not be performing very well internationally because the international community are also looking at these things. How well are you balancing your role to be able to produce the results for your country? So you cannot be <laughs> scoring excellent scores in international indexes if your only fight against corruption is focuses on the past. I don't think even President Biu wants to succeed in the fight against corruption by running after only the opposition. He wants us, and he has repeatedly told me that, look, Look at our government. When there are issues there, set examples. I want us to succeed, and I want our reputation as a country that champions the fight against corruption not to be hypocritical. That is the kind of president that I am working with. And uh, to say that we are looking at the past alone is definitely not correct. L let's talk about um, how do you go about um, selecting the chosen cases that should go to court or, uh, and those that should pay back. W what, what informs um, the decisions you make when you, people, you, you're looking at people or you're looking at cases and who are the set of people that should pay back? Is it cherry picking? Uh, one reason why we are scoring very well in our effort against corruption is the way we have diversified the fight against corruption. We have made sure that the fight against corruption does not only focus to go into court. We are not like a processing plant where we just process people, send them to court and wait for thy kingdom come or for wait for whatsoever the mercy of the justice system can bring. We have used that for 18 years, and we were where we are. In 2014, we were, the, the, we were, we were on record as the most corrupt country, perception-wise, wise in the world by Transparency International, 2013 leading to 2014. And the reason why that was happening, it was not because we did not have strong policies or good policies to tackle and fight corruption. It's because our fight against corruption was weak. It was weak because we were going after the person instead of the assets. So when I came in, one of the policies which we introduced and has worked very well is what we call non-conviction-based asset recovery. You can Google it. Non-conviction-based asset recovery or non-conviction-based based assets, assets, assets for future. These are global standards for fighting corruption. They are the strongest way to fight corruption. When you go after the asset that is stolen, and recover it. That is what Nigeria is doing very well. When you hear that money has been returned from Nigeria because Sani Abacha was investigated, it's not that they are not aware that people have facilitated Sani Abacha's corruption mm -hmm. for the money to leave. They could have spent several years going after those people trying to prosecute them, but instead they went after the money in the Swiss bank and most of it is coming back to Nigeria. The same thing is happening in other countries like France. The same thing is happening in other countries like Senegal, Ivory Coast, Burkina Faso. They simply just go after the assets and get them. But we in Sierra Leone did not just go after the assets because we understand that the justice system is very important. 
That is why I tried to forge a very powerful and good relationship with the judiciary. And we set up the anti-corruption division of the high court where you have justice judges. The only thing that we needed to do about the judiciary is to make sure that we do not clock the judiciary with too many cases and they have other things to do. But the moment we created a clear pathway whereby our cases do not queue behind other cases, we had our own division in court and specialized judges were put there to determine cases and reach decision. We had the justice system moving seamlessly. And the justice, the judges of the high court and even those in the court of appeal have really bought in into what we are doing. They are sending the right message. They are convicting on a mass scale. In 2019, we had 16 convictions out of 20. Even two days ago, we had another conviction. We have not announced it because sentencing is taking place on Monday. So, whilst we are using the judiciary as is traditionally respected and as it should be, we diversified so that we can, the fight against the strength of the fight against corruption cannot depend on what other people do. It has to depend on what the institution that fights corruption can do. So recovering the assets is our own role. That is why we are not only recovering money, over two, about $2.5 million now is what we have recovered, but we are also recovering houses. You know, we handed over even a hotel to the government, which uh, we, we, we felt was acquired corruptly. We have gone after vehicles as far as Guinea and bring them in Sierra Leone, and we hand it over to government in the open. That is a diversified fight against corruption. But there is also a part of the fight against corruption which we are doing very well, which people are not taking note of very well because it is not one of those sensational ones. The administrative aspect. Most of our investigations, we refer to the institutions and say, okay, let's say the AYV is a, is a public institution. We've investigated the, the procurement officer here and he was behaving badly. It is not every day case we have to charge the court. But we can go back to say, this man abused his position, he abused his office. We believe that the procedure he followed, he ought to have known that it was wrong. We are sending him back to you, the head of the institution, to punish him and tell us what you have done about it. And sometimes people are dismissed, people are suspended, people are expelled, people are queried. It sends the right message within the institution. And we also work with them to embed prevention measures to make sure that these things are not repeated. So it is the culmination of all these measures that is producing the results that we are having now. And that is how we have to do. Diversification is the way to go, and we are succeeding at it as a country. And this is really, really working well that other countries in Africa are now focusing on us to what is happening in Sierra Leone. This is, this is something we have to learn. Best practices, that is why you see almost, if it were not COVID, I will have to give speeches everywhere in the world on the issues, on how we are tackling corruption in Sierra Leone as a best practice measure, which other countries are also copying. So, so um, amidst the diversification approach in the fight against corruption, yes. you just spoke about how you've um, managed to forge a very good relationship with the judiciary. Yes. And the judiciary has been one, um, one factor that has been blamed largely for the way the fight against corruption has been in this country. Yes. Now, so how are you, how were you able to navigate against the odds in the judiciary? Well, the thing is, you know, I was a lawyer for over mm. 10 years. I is, it's now going to 13 years as a lawyer. And uh, I had very good relationship with the justices before I became commissioner. And the current chief justice is a really, really uh, good administrator, somebody who understands what the fight against corruption is about, and he has really, really bought into it and made it an agenda of a judiciary to support. So... That support coming from this chief justice at that high level behind us, it is easy for him to help us deploy tools to make sure we are not going to court to ensure that all innocent people are convicted, no. But when the evidence is there to support our case, two things happen. One, we get conviction. And when we get conviction, the punishment has to be serious enough for it to be a deterrent. So what we have been doing is to ensure that Judges go through trainings and understand these things and they help us in the fight against corruption because there is no point. One of the things that was affecting the fight against corruption is the posture of the judiciary was not such that it was creating the necessary deterrent effect that the country needed. But we are working with them now and uh, a lot has changed. Uh, the justices who are dealing with this from Justice Samba to Justice Reginald Finn to Justice uh, Cosmo Tinajares, Justice, Justice Al-Hadi, uh, 
Justice al Husayn C.C., Justice Ivan C.C., many of them, Justice Simeon Aliu, who are really dealing with our anti corruption cases, are sending the right message within the population. Let me not forget Justice John Bosco Aliu as well. These are all people who have really bought into the vision of what it means for us to take the fight against corruption to another level and to send the right message within the population. And that is why the result that is coming from the judiciary is faster. Before, it was the minimum punishment that was being imposed when they fined people 30 million. Now judges are fining up to 250 million euros per count. So people have to think twice before they engage in corruption. So it is that alliance and buy-in from the judiciary that is also working well and is helping us. And we are very grateful to all these justices I have named for their support that they are giving us as we go through the efforts in the fight against corruption. Francis, let me ask you this question just out of curiosity. Has there been any point in time that calls have, have come into Francis? Um, and those calls, uh, the ultimate goal is to um, silence uh, Francis or blind his eye towards a particular person or a case. Or, 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 or have, have, have bags be coming your way to say, Francis, you, you can have this, let's just forget about, about this. In, in other words, um, in what forms have attempts been made to, to just um, keep you away from some cases or individuals? Well, these things take a lot of way. Um, sometimes people who try to influence you can be direct or indirect, or they can even be oblique, as the case may be. So, for example, they will, they will find somebody who has leverage over you, an uncle who has helped you in life, mm. uh, a brother, somebody they know has influence over you, your former teacher and those people, they go to them and suddenly you see this man is now becoming very friendly with you. And after a while, he will tell you, well, you know, this young man has this case before you. What do you do about it? So what I do very well is I am a very listening person. But I know when to draw the line. So I, 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 I make you see reason why you should not interfere with what I am doing. So, for example, most people, when they go to seek the assistance of other people to help them in avoiding the consequences of their own actions of punishment, they don't say the truth. So when an uncle, for example, speaks with me, I will tell the uncle what this person did. And some uncles are already very principled from that moment. They will say, ah, no, 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 no. no. This is not what this man told me, so I'm not interfering anymore. So I'm very good at that. I'm very good at, at bringing the juggler that will shock your mind to make you back off from behind me. But those who persist, it's easy for me to draw the line and say, look, I am sorry. I cannot do this. Or if I know that they are leading towards bribery, for example, or trying to offer money or everything, I don't even allow them to get there. I, 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 I am capable of hitting the table in the presence of anybody and say, I think this meeting is over and I stand up. And that signals to you that you have to leave. So these are the kinds of techniques that I use to s ensure that uh, I absorb what he's doing. Uh, in the process, I get a lot of threatening remarks. I get text messages. You saw, I'm sure you saw when they were sharing my number on all social media for people to call me. For five days, I could not sleep. My phone was ringing like continuously. People calling me from all over the country. Some will insult me. Some will tell me that when APC comes to power, they will come after me. They will do this. My trial will be one day at the cutting tree. Those kinds of threats, they will, they will, they will threaten my children. They will say they will do this to them. And uh, it's all those techniques. And I, I just keep focused and ensure that it is God who provides the ultimate protection. And I also take safeguards as necessary. What, 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 um, would you recall a particular date that perhaps um, the president would pick a phone and say, Francis, that's my interest? Would you recall a date? No, uh, well, I, the current president really, that is one reason why I, I, there is no shame in giving him his due. He does not interfere in anti-corruption issues. And I'm sure you had the Commission of Inquiry, George, shower praise at him for not interfering. And I will do the same. He, he basically, I mean, he would want to know what is happening in the country. And sometimes you would discuss it with him. But to say that he will call you and say, no, 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 this person do not hold him. You saw what he did for the Ministry of Education. Uh, the moment that we took the evidence to him that this is what he was doing, he just relieved everybody of their duty. That is something which is not commonly seen in Africa. I think the president has been an example in the fight against corruption. 
and he deserves the title as the champion of the fight against corruption. All right, um, it is Francis Ben Kefala, the um, Commissioner for Sierra Leone's Anti Corruption Commission, and we're discussing um, his experience in the last two years. Let's go for a um, quick break, and when we come back, we will continue to look at um, his challenges and successes in the last two years. They say we slept in one world and woke up in another. This global tragedy got humans together despite our social distancing. Our nature is taking a break. And giving us a wake up call on what and who truly matters. Look around you, hold on. Breathe. Count your blessings. Take time for self-renewal. For a better start tomorrow. Soon, life will be back. Meanwhile, let's stand apart together. With one heart. All right, welcome back. Uh, I still have the Anti-Corruption Commissioner, Francis Ben Kaifala, here with us, um, talking about his um, second year anniversary as the country's anti-graft boss. Now, Francis, let's talk about uh, the successes. We've, we've seen statistics uh, putting the fight against corruption in a very positive footing, and the trajectory has been very, very welcomed by many civil unions. Uh, what is leading to all those successes? Well, uh, it's a carefully planned and thought out engineering uh, being implemented in the country. The strategies and the tactics that we are using are working well. And as you know, this is war. And in war, there are strategies, which is the overall plan. For example, the prevention plan that we are deploying in MDAs, the, the IMCs that are working very well. We have the investigations that are happening on a massive scale, covering all spheres of social life, so everybody is on their toes. I mean, people have to look over their shoulder before they do something corrupt. Now, of course, we have the prosecution that is ongoing, and all of them is being cemented by a very powerful public education and public information system that has been developed at the ACC, whereby we inform the population in real time as to what is happening we bring them along, um, we respond to their queries, inquiries, and questions in real time. Uh, the, the, the public relations machinery at the ACC is, is one of the most powerful in the country, and uh, that has worked, and that is within the framework of the strategy. We also have the enforcement strategy, where we are making the fight against corruption very visible. It is not abstract anymore. So the Scorpion Squad, for example, I mean, the country has fallen in love with the Scorpio Squad, a very powerful elite squad that go in and produce the results that are needed with precision, with evidence, pictures, videos. Everybody can see. It's not like somebody saying people are corrupt. No, there is nobody in Sierra Leone who does not know that the, the Scorpio Squad, when they go in, they come with something that is good. They are carrying out raids in offices. They are carrying out raids along the streets. They are carrying out the raids at checkpoints. They are going into hospitals, homes, and everywhere just to get the evidence for the people to see. So we have basically succeeded in taking corruption from the abstract to the visible. And that is helping us to succeed. And uh, the strategies and the tactics that we are using, things like the Scorpion Squad are just tactics that help capture the mind for them to understand what is happening. They are working very well. So this engineering that we are deploying within the system is working. Uh, all I would want is for Sierra Leoneans to be a little more patient and to be more understanding. This is war. This is not an everyday thing. The same way we are fighting against coronavirus is the same way we have been fighting against corruption for a very long time. 
if we are to succeed in it, there will not only be successes all the time, there will also be what we call collateral damage at some point in time. Let them understand that the overall objective is for the good of the country and they should stand with us and behind us when those situations happen. Because it is very demoralizing when um, the very people you are fighting for are the ones who are very quick to judge you, to, to, to demonize you, to uh, demoralizing for my staff and the people who are working day in, day night to succeed. But so far, so good. Everything is working for our good. Every index, Mo Ibrahim, Transparency International, Freedom House, MCC Control of Corruption Scorecard, no matter where you take it from, the fight against corruption is heading in the right direction, in a positive trajectory. And it is not just that we are heading in that direction, it's the degree to which we are doing it. I mean, we are jumping from 49% to 79%. <laughs> These are things that we are unprecedented and unthought of. We are scoring the highest scores in Transparency International scores. Uh, these are all things that we are, we are unprecedented. We are jumping 10 places when countries are stagnating and countries are going backwards in the fight against corruption. In the CPI, we jump 10 places in one go. These are all things really that are showing that Sierra Leone is doing something that is working. And we continue to seek the support of every actor whether it is the political will, whether it is the people's support for our strategies, our techniques, our start strategies, because it is working. If it is working, all you can do is to keep doing it. It's not to make sure you undermine it. What, what, what would you consider um, in the last 24 months as your most challenging period in, uh, in that chair? Uh, the most challenging period in that chair was really when we launched the the new anti-corruption strategy that was supposed to guide our path for the next four years. This strategy was negotiated by people. I was not myself directly involved. I was consulted like everybody. It was experts we brought from every sphere of society who stand for the fight, who understand what is happening in the country. I mean, Valnora Edwins, Dr. Taki and others, Mr. Kamanda. These are really, really uh, reliable Sierra Leoneans who put together this strategy. And at the heart of this strategy, they said that the commission has to be more robust with fighting corruption, that the commission should take more drastic steps, basically, in the fight against corruption. One week after that strategy was, was imposed, we caught people red-handed, and uh, we thought that maybe it's a good way for us to just introduce them to the population, that these are the criminals we caught over the weekend. And you know what happened. Um, uh, I saw the proverbial Barabbas situation, where uh, they say, give us Barabbas, behead Jesus. And um, nobody wants to find himself in that kind of situation. Although I know that there were many well-meaning Sierra Leoneans who supported what happened, who wanted it to happen. And I am not going into the merits or the merits of whatsoever happened. But uh, if you were me, of course, there were people who were, who were basically thinking that I was going to resign, I was going to leave the job. And, uh, but we moved on from it stronger. The following weekend, we carried out a similar raid with greater evidence of people doing the very thing that we are trying to forestall, for which we are, we are um, treated that way. And uh, we moved on from it stronger. But that period, sitting down, people who have known you for years, they know your values, they know what you stand for. They understand what you are fighting for, what you hope to achieve. To see them, some of them writing articles as long as a book, just on that one issue alone. I saw my own friends jumping all over social media about the things that I did. And they forgot that the overall objective was there. And this was not informed by my own individual decision. This was informed by the strategy that had been launched by the Vice President, Dr. Mohamed Judah Jalo, two weeks earlier. And we just wanted to use new techniques to achieve the same purpose of corruption control. So um, whilst all what they did, we, we didn't, I didn't, I personally didn't take it personal because I knew it was in the best interest of all of us to engage and to understand what is happening. But if you ask me a difficult moment, that is a difficult moment right there. Is this something you, 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 you regretted? Uh, no, 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 no. I, I, I still think that... Um, it is not about regret. It is about trying different things. The results may be controversial. 
At the end of the day, fighting corruption is not for the faint-hearted. Fighting corruption is not for the faint-hearted. So, understanding that, you will take decisions and actions that many people will find shocking. But uh, it's about what the overall outcome is. As I have said, whatsoever we did resulted in positives for the country, and I, I would prefer to dwell on that. Okay? The country's eye opened up to the rot that we sat on in terms of examination malpractice in a way that had never been known or seen before. And action was taken almost immediately. The president took it very seriously. He gave the speech after he came back from Ivory Coast. Remember the speech he gave? Outlining what the government was doing about examination malpractice when he went to open the school at Juba. I think there was a hall opening mm -hmm. at Juba. Set up an interministerial uh, decision making body on examination malpractice. A, a, an interministerial conference was put up. The conference of principals took a position on the issue. Schools set up robust systems. We saw what happened at the grammar school where they were now carrying out their own action on examination malpractice and other schools across the country. We saw that things were changing. Wayek, for example, the management of Wayek was changed. An entire team of Wayek left Ghana, came here, met with me to discuss this issue, provide the evidence with them. And they went and wrote back to say, what happened in Sierra Leone has opened our eyes to other countries. And it has helped us to develop better strategies to deal with issues of examination malpractice. To me, that is the what I take from everything that happened. The result that came out of it brought about a revolution when it came to examination malpractice. And the country, even now when exams are happening, you should go to the schools. It's like war front. There is soldiers, teachers, everybody standing on alert, making sure that cheating is no longer encouraged. And it was because by our actions, we brought such an issue to the fore. So I do not regret it. I think it is one of the the things that have changed the cause of this country for good, and I'm sure somewhere down the line it is going to be appreciated. Until then, we will continue doing what we have to do for the good of the country. Uh, on, on who, when you fight corruption, on whose side are you? Are you on the side of the people or on the side of the government? Now, if you're on the side of the people, you have definitely some people who celebrate um, um, corrupt people just because they are surviving or gaining a lot from those corrupt people. If you're on the side of government, um, do, you f do you follow the flow of also the corrupt politicians that definitely you, whose interests you would want to protect? Whose side are you? Uh, the commission is the People's Commission. In the Anti-Corruption Act, we are accountable to the people of Sierra Leone. We provide a report to the president and to parliament for the people of Sierra Leone. But our work is a people-centered work. So whatsoever we do is for the interest of the people and not individual's interest, whether it is politicians or whosoever is in public office. So that is basically the ethos, the foundation upon which our work stands. Let's talk about asset declaration. Very recently we saw um, you giving deadline for um, government officials and even past government officials to declare their assets. How has that uh, been so far? Well, um, you see, like I am saying, the reforms that we have done at the Commission are amazing. Asset declaration is one thing that was not working in the Commission at all. If you speak to previous commissioners, they will tell you that all the efforts they put in, declaration rates will just not go up. So when I came in, one thing I did was to reform the law so that it can get better. So that reform was what we did. We now introduce sanctions for non-compliance. We introduce a system whereby we reduce the pool so that it is more targeted. We strengthen the department that is responsible for collecting and um, administering asset declarations. And the results were clear. I'm sure you passed by Lotto Building. For the first time, you could see for several days there was a queue starting from Lotto Building all the way coming down to the vice president's office. People wanting to declare voluntarily because of the kinds of reforms we have made. And this has been very successful. Whereas the average um, compliance rate has been around 40%, we are expecting this year we are going to be over 80% compliance for public servants. And that would be an amazing result 
The World Bank has said that our asset declaration regime is the prototype that they want to use in Africa. So they really want to see how well we succeed with it. And already by the very reform that we are, we are the only country that has consequences, administrative consequences for non-compliance with asset declaration regime anywhere in the world. If that works, we are going to have people coming. And we already have. Uganda came to study our asset declaration regime not too long ago, about three months ago. They went back. Malawi wrote to come. It was COVID that stopped them from coming. Nigeria, Ghana, everybody has been showing interest. I have been exchanging communications just to advise as to how they can structure their asset declaration regime for it to work. So this is really one of the things that is, it has not yet succeeded in that we are still at the piloting stage. But we are hoping that it is going to be a beacon, a light that Sierra Leone is going to be known for when it comes to anti-corruption activities in Africa. What, what relevance will that, ha will, will that add to the fight against corruption, asset declaration? Asset declaration instills integrity in public space because we are capable of tracing what public officers have. So when they have what they cannot explain, it will be deemed corrupt. We already have an offense called un unexplained wealth. So let's say you come into office. I saw people saying that one of the things they have been laughing is when teachers had to declare their assets. Mm. There is nothing wrong for you to say you have nothing in the asset declaration. In fact, teachers should, if they don't have assets, they should simply say, I don't have an asset. It is because it is named asset declaration does not mean you have to declare an asset. However, once you declare that you don't have anything, it is easy for us to know when tomorrow you have a mansion. And I saw people make it ridicule on social media. There are teachers who own mansions that you cannot imagine. I know of teachers who own mansions, who own resources well. They drive powerful cars. Yet, they thought that we did not know what we are doing. We know what we are doing. We know exactly how some of these wealth are gained even by teachers. But we also know how wealth is gained by public servants. Asset declaration regime helps us to be able to trace. For example, the state chief of protocol, Madam Edna Cabo, what saved her is asset declaration. Because she declared in 2014, 15, 16, 17, 18 that she was building a house. So when she eventually was called in to explain her wealth, it was easy for her to justify that I have been building this house. I, was, I did not just build it today in 2019. And that is one of the reasons that we were easy to easily compute her, her emoluments since she became a public servant and cross-referenced it to other resources she may have had in her work and we were able to free her and clear her for her not being corrupt. Transparently and openly and fairly. So those who think that asset declaration is, is something they should take lightly, they should think again. It can save you. But it can also help us because you will know that if you own a mansion when one year ago you've declared that you have nothing, it's easy for us to say this is unexplained wealth. And that is the relevance of asset declaration regime. Just out of curiosity, I want to take you back to the relationship yes, you, you, you mentioned earlier with the judiciary. Yes. We still have... Um, perhaps one of the longest um, cases in the court, the 50th anniversary committee. How, how is that panning out? On that case regime? was tried before Justice Cham, mm. who is no longer the Chief Justice. You know, he was the Chief Justice. Um, but we are in contact with him, myself, and the Chief Justice, for him to write the judgment still, and so that it can be delivered. So um, a lot of things happened with that case. Justice Cham was a judge at the time when he had it. Later, he became Chief Justice. Of course, he became overwhelmed with work. And uh, um, later, eventually, he resigned and left the judiciary. But we are trying to do what best we can do for that case to come forward, and we can move on with it. Let's talk uh, about the, ca the current um, eye cases you're, you're investigating, say, mm -hmm. the, mini the Minister of Labor, the Deputy of Education, the Permanent Secretary of Education, and even Parliament. Uh, uh, how far are you? in? to those investigations? Well, the, 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 the rice matter is in court, as you know. Um, we have hit a little bit of an uh, issue there because for the first time in the history of Sierra Leone, the Attorney General said she did not believe that trial by George alone was going to produce the optimal result. Uh, it was going to not produce justice. So she wrote to say that she's not providing the trial by George alone. And it's a prerogative and right to do so. And if she does not believe that this is what will happen, she can say so, and which she has done. 
we are now caught in between the rock and the hard place as to whether to rely on jury trial. But again, corruption cases are so complex that <laughs> you cannot give it to jury to decide. Uh, particularly that kind of complex mm. case like the rice investigation where you are charging misappropriation of 49,000 bags of rice because you think it did not take the correct route before it got to whosoever it got. Um, so right now we are at the point where we are reviewing our strategy in respect of this case in the light of this objection that came from the Honorable Attorney General and uh, to see what action we can take that we still produce the good for the country uh, but also uh, be able to send the right message within the population. That is what we are now reviewing and uh, trying to move forward. On other cases like the, the what other case did you say? The parliament, parliament investigation is in advanced stages. Another two weeks that is going to be over. With, with, with all of these things you've mentioned and, and how overwhelmed uh, you are with the fight against corruption, Francis, what, 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 what's your favorite meal? What do you like eating most? <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting <laughs> question. Uh, I think I, 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 I like the Mendesos Pela mm. very well. Uh, I like it with country rice. But I also like cassava leaves. <laughs> how often do you have time to eat? I, I, I mean, how, because I, I, I'm just trying to, to look at how busy you are and whether you find time for uh -huh. other things, family, food, and other things like yes, that. I, how I, do you balance that? It's not easy, really. Uh, my work puts a lot of pressure on me when it comes to relationships and uh, people. Uh, the time I have for family and things like that. But uh, they all understand that it's a national service. And one good thing this job does, it is so visible. Everybody is seeing the result. They know what's happening day in, day out. Our public relations department is keeping the public so well informed that it is about people who give excuses for me. And they will say, I understand you were busy. Or I have not been able for, to see you for so long because I know. But I see and I hear and I feel what you are doing for the country. I am grateful. And that happens to loved ones, close ones, and family as well. They understand that this is really an important national service that requires my time and attention. They also understand that I cannot be as available as would be because, for example, social gatherings. I don't go to social gatherings mm. because I have to limit my interactions for various and obvious reasons. So these things are all there. But I try as best as possible to have fun in my own way. Trust me, I have fun. <laughs> <laughs> do, 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 you miss, do you miss going to court as um, um, lawyer Francis Ben Kaifala? Oh, yes. In fact, two days ago, I went to my chambers. Mm. And I sat in my office after a very long time. And uh, I could feel <laughs> that sense of nostalgia <laughs> of what used to be in this office, how mm. I used to plan myself to go to court, standing for cases, whether it's commercial cases, whether it's human rights cases, whether it's constitutional cases, and all the things that go with them. I really miss them sometimes. But uh, I think I am doing a very good service for the country, and I think I should just focus on that for now. And uh, maybe sometime down the line, I will go back to wearing that wig and standing up to do what I do best, lawyering. <laughs> as, we prepare for your th as you prepare for your third year in, in, in that office, how, 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 how strong do you get every day, um, taking into consideration the, the enormity of the task you have? Well, uh, the challenges are always enormous. And uh, with the fight against corruption, it does not get easy as you go. Because, uh, like you rightly said, we are now dealing with people in the current government. And when you are dealing with past government officials, it's easier because you don't have the same pressures as you do when you are dealing with people in the current system and the current uh, framework of things. Um, it continues to get tougher, but I continue to trust God. I, I, am, a, I am a strong Catholic, and I, I pray a lot. I put things that I do to God. And I also rely on the strength that he gives me. I rely on the support that I have of the staff around me who have been very supportive, who continue to really, really be there for me. I don't have to be at the commission for things to happen. Uh, I, my absence at the commission does not change anything. Things move on. And that is really the work and the handiwork of God. 
I am continuing to rely on that. I continue to rely on the support of the president and his uh, team, his cabinet and all those around him. I am continuing to rely on the people who work in the media. I'm continuing to rely on the work of the civil society. I'm continuing to rely on the people of Sierra Leone for us to continue this journey that we have started. I believe that if we fight to control corruption, as we have put the Anti-Corruption Commission at the center of the social revolution that Sierra Leone needs, I believe that Sierra Leone will never be the same again. We will find the glory that we had lost and go to places that we only imagined. All right, thank you very much, Francis. As I look forward to um, having that invite to mark the second year anniversary. The uh, the now we the cannot <laughs> shake hands, <laughs> but definitely we can do this. We can that. do this, yes, All right. yes. Thank you very much thank for being part of the conversation. Much, it's always and, a pleasure having and you. And I here. always thank AYV. I mean, one of the driving force that has been behind our success is really the showcasing of our work by AYV. They're always there. When I call on them that we are doing this video, they will come. And I really appreciate all of you. I appreciate uh, Gino Navu. I appreciate Lamrana. All of them, Stella Bangura, everybody who works at AYV, the team, the technical team, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And there you have it from um, lawyer Francis Ben Kaifala, the country's anti graft um, boss. Um, he has been in office for two years and he has shared his experience, um, the highs, the lows, and um, the things that he has faced in terms of temptations and how he has navigated his path smoothly to ensuring that he upholds that which he has been appointed to serve Sierra Leone for. Until we meet again, my name is Samuel Weisberg. I'm saying take good care of yourself and have a good day. Thank you.